Welcome to the Northeast Kingdom Voice. I'm your host, Scott Wheeler. Today's guest is Pierre Gervais, a, well, not so new resident of Island Pond, but he is a returning resident of Island Pond. Uh, Pierre and I were classmates at North Country High School. We were graduates of 1984, and he went on to lead an illustrious career in the military, including retiring as a colonel. And he's here today to talk about his career, talk about his life. Maybe he can inspire other people to work for their dreams. Welcome to the show uh pierre good to be here thanks always always a pleasure to come back and talk with you i know we did this a few years ago yeah you you were colonel gervais then i was i actually had my uniform on so this is a little bit different i've taken the vermont attire with some flannel and uh grown a little bit of uh, scruff on my face you know we've talked about actually i think you've been on my Seems like maybe you've been on my show a couple times, the radio show. We did the radio show, and then we did this. Well, well, this time we're doing both at once. <laughs> is we, we're, uh, as the saying goes, we're killing two birds with one stone. Right. You know the one thing I pointed out to you? Um, well, first of all, Steve Wheeler, our <laughs> classmate, no, yep. relation, no direct relation to me, yep. he's always telling me that he's always reminding me at one time I was actually tall is in – I stopped growing in junior high, and my locker was right next to his, and he said, you are so tall. And then by the time he and I, well, we graduated, Steve and I were probably on the shorter end, shorter end of our graduating class for the men. Yeah. But one thing it seems to me is, uh, did they put you on the rack in the military and stretch you? Because am I wrong? Weren't you shorter in yeah, high school? Yeah, I was. I, actually, about my junior year is when I started to grow. Uh, and then when I got to, uh, to Norwich University, uh, my, my college, that's when I stretched out a little bit. And then the military, I think, helped out. Right. Yeah. Cause and I, as I aged, uh, I kind of went the other direction. Right. You know, it's funny how you go. You have your ebbs and flows with, with height. Right. Um, but um, – so I I'm kind I kind of know your story and it's it is a good one. You went to um, Norwich uh, University, yep. and did did you in, was it your dream to serve in the military or no? It's it you know I I've thought about this so much in terms of uh, what <clears throat> what drove me into the to go into the military, and I think it's because. You know, through high school, as you know, I was an athlete, you yeah. know, played hockey, played baseball, uh, played soccer, uh, came out of high school thinking that I was going to get a scholarship to play hockey, and I, and I didn't. So I had to go to a junior college, improve my grades. Did that for two years, and then my dad actually said, you know, why don't you try Norwich? Because I had Mark Schubring, uh, who grew up in my hometown uh, of Island Pond, uh, was already there, and so... I did it. I went. I went into the uh, into the Norwich, started the ROTC program, and graduated in 1989 uh, from Norwich University, and that that's really what uh, kicked off my career. So there was really not something historical like my family. Right, you know, right. a lot of times if your parents serve or if you've got family that has right. served, that you, but for me it was more like I've got to take this opportunity because if I don't, my life is going to go downhill. And that's really what uh, what got me started. Right. Um, yeah. And, and you mentioned you know you were into uh, you were into sports and that, but um, I, I think your family. I don't know if it was your father or uncles or who they were, but didn't you also have some family in the race uh, yeah. stock <laughs> stock car world? Oh yeah, that's my cousin Reno. Yeah, uh, the king of the kingdom. As, yeah, as they uh, as they alluded. Yeah, my cousin Reno was a big. Uh, Started in Groveton and then went up into uh, into Barry and raced at the uh, I forget what the uh, the big track is called up there in Barry, but oh Thunder Road, uh, Thunder Road, exactly. Yeah. And uh, he kept he kept moving up from small cars to you know uh, the late models and right. uh, did did really well. In fact, one year when I was in uh, Massachusetts getting my masters uh, before I taught at West Point, right. uh, I got my masters in uh, sports psychology i actually went uh because we were so close i got my master's in springfield mass right and we were so close to home i had the summer off uh i i was on his pit crew for one year 
And it's interesting because I was, like I said, I was getting my master's in sports psychology, which is really about human performance. You know, you do goal setting, focus training, attention, visualization. I was able to work with him, you know, on some of the techniques that I was learning, you know, to get him to be a better race car driver. Uh, And he actually won. Uh, (laughs) He actually won that year. Uh, and on the hood uh, of his car, he had, at the time I was a major, it was Major Pierre Gervais, 101st Airborne, you know, thanks for your service kind of stuff. But it, it, it's, it's funny how, you know, you, you recollect some of these things that, that have happened. Right. And you grew up in the store business? My dad owned a store, yeah. So actually, you know, just to, if you want to rewind real quick, uh, you know, born in New Hampshire, um, and then immediately my father, who was born and raised in Canada, moved us back to Canada. So I actually lived in Quebec, uh, Sherbrooke, for the first seven years of my life. Right. And then we moved back to Island Pond in Vermont when he bought a store. Right. And he was in the market business. His brother, Marcel, had the plumbing and heating. His other brother, Richard, had the construction company. So there was, uh, at the time, that was mid-70s, you know, Island Pond was... As you know, Island Pond was booming. Yep. You know, we had the Ethan Allen factories. We had the train. Canadian National was running really well back then. Had the lumber business. So Island Pond, you know, had a, had a name for itself. Right. Uh, and right. And you also, I know it's not a business, but then you also had the influx of the 12 who are now the 12 tribes. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and, and that brought in a new <laughs> that, dynamic. Yeah, that put, that put us on the map probably for yeah. not, not the right reason, right. but it did put us on the map. Right. Yeah. Um, so uh, so back to uh, Norwich now. So you're at yep. Norwich, and at, it sounds like something clicked in with you and the cadets. Yeah, it was uh, – you know, there was a sense of discipline. There was a sense of organization. There was a sense of doing something bigger than yourself that I was learning at the time. Right. And I think most of us who go into the military service, you go into the service, but there's not really a realization of why you're serving completely. Right. Right? Because the military is a profession. Uh, we talked about this last time I was on. Right. You know, and as a profession, much like doctors, lawyers, nurses, you know, police and fire firemen, the military profession demands that what you do is beyond yourself. Right. Right. You signed your name on a dotted line, and that dotted line basically said, "I will support and defend the Constitution." You raise your right hand, and my profession is: no matter what, if my country calls, I am going to put my life on the line. Right. There's not many professions that can say that. Mm -hmm. Doctors save lives. Lawyers get you out of jail. Lawyers keep you out of jail. Mm -hmm. Nurses save lives. But for us, it was protecting the whole of a country. And it really didn't dawn on me. So I started my military service. Uh, It was really a hardship tour in uh, Hawaii. Uh, Right. (laughs) But I spent six years in Hawaii. And one of the one of the uh, positions that I held was working for the POW MIA task force. Right. And that that job in and of itself is when my eyes were really open as to why this profession that I signed up for really mattered. And that is because on uh, three or four of the occasions that I would travel into the um, into Southeast Asia, there was one, you know, you, you recover, we would recover remains of those that were missing. Uh, we would find information for, you know, the loved ones that were back here who had no information, you know, and that's one thing the U.S. does that's different than a lot of countries where we try to bring back our fallen. And we, you know, because there's a, there's a, a sense of uh, closure uh, by bringing them back. Without that, you know, you're, you're still kind of out there. But there was one time, I'll tell you if I have time. Oh, yeah, sure. There was one time. Uh, we went on a mission, and it was a uh, – at the time, this was 1994, 95, 94, 95. And we were going on uh, a mission in Vietnam to find the remains of three uh, POWs that had died. And the guy who was leading us was an active duty command sergeant major, a military police command sergeant major out of Germany. And we flew over, and what we would do is we would fly into Bangkok, Thailand. We would drive down to uh, southern Thailand. We would take a C-130. We'd fly into Vietnam. And in Vietnam, we would take helicopters, uh, believe it or not, Russian helicopters, uh, 
into these very, very remote sites. And so as, as we did this trip and we got to a location, we landed and we had to march into Triple Canopy Jungle for about 12 miles. It was, it was a haul. And if you can imagine about 12 people, uh, plus this command sergeant major who was still active duty, were walking up. And the reason that he was with us is because he was a POW himself, okay? And he had written on a napkin, he had recounted and visualized and put it on a napkin where his friends, his comrades, had passed mm. and where he personally buried them, okay? And so as we're walking up, he's telling us these stories, and, and, and you start to understand, mm. you know, earlier we were talking about empathy right. and how putting yourself in somebody else's shoes is always a good thing, you know, instead of assuming, you empathize a little bit right. and try to understand. You know, emotional intelligence is huge in terms of developing and understanding human behaviors. But all of a sudden I started to say, okay, <laughs> Here he was, a young teenager, you know, had got drafted. He's in a war, and he's he's made friends with somebody. And those friends, you know, you're just talking about Steve Wheeler and, yeah. and Mark Schubert. Imagine us four on the trail. We get captured, and, and three of us die, but one of us is around. That sense of bringing somebody back, yeah. you know, was with him for 30 years, 30-plus mm. years. And so you start to – to think about this and you're like okay this is this profession is a lot different right. than what I thought it was really for well in in the story we ended up going uh, we found the site where um, uh, his his guys uh, potentially his comrades were buried and he had marked a tree there was a tree uh, believe it or not that he had marked specifically we, we searched for about a half day, and then we finally found a location that we thought was relatively close. And he said, let's try off of this, this tree. And no kidding, our graves registration uh, guys and our anthropologists that we used to take with us, one dig into the ground, and we hit, we hit remains. Oh, really? And so here's this command sergeant major who lost his buddies, <laughs> and now, you know, he's, he's found. He's, he's going to bring them home. And we did. We brought them home. Probably one of the most uh, revealing things for me uh, at the time as a young captain that said, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Right. And this is why it's changed those experiences, as you know. Right. Experiences build who you are as a person. Right, exactly. You know? And so I, I, had, I had a lot of experiences in high school, some good, some bad. Right. Experiences in college, but the experiences that I had in the military – are really what molded me to be who I am now, right. you know. And that that story has always stuck with me because we we broke down. I mean, it was just it was really good. He broke down, uh, and I've talked about you know challenge coins. You know, in the military, we give coins for you know uh, the unit that you're in or right. for doing a good job. He gave me his coin, and I have that to this day in my. Uh, in my keepsake box. And you have a photo uh, with one uh, person who came along on the, a trip with you, a Vietnam veteran himself and a U.S., well, former U.S. Senator, John Kerry. <laughs> and yes. what's that story? Yeah. So that was a, uh, interestingly, uh, Senator Kerry at the time, yeah, he, uh, he was in Vietnam, obviously, and he had lost a number of, um, a number of folks. During the mid-90s, uh, when this uh, POW MIA task force uh, was developing, we were looking for extra monies to continue the mission. Senator Kerry came out uh, to Vietnam to see what we were doing so that he could push through Congress uh, additional budgets in order for us to continue right. you know, this mission. And it wasn't just for Southeast Asia. We did Southeast Asia. We did uh, we did a repatriation out of China. We would do a lot out of the Pacific. So it was really a worldwide mission, but right. we focused on Southeast Asia at the time. So myself and uh, Dr. Finnegan out of Kansas State University were leading a team of 15 folks looking for two LURS-D, which is long-range surveillance detachments, yeah. uh, in scout, scout teams for the sets. And basically, you know, uh, these two folks who had who were killed uh, had broken rule number one, which is 
never let your guard down. They were on patrol. Uh, they were hot, sweaty, as you can imagine, in Vietnam. And they had, they had, um, there was a waterfall, and they had take, they were taking a shower without any guards. And uh, the enemy saw him, shot him, and uh, buried him. Well, interestingly, uh, we had we had to build relationships with the Vietnamese right. because they're the ones that actually knew where most of this stuff was. And we would recount sort of what we knew historically of the story, what had happened, and then hoping by canvassing locals uh, out of Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, we were able to get to a, a closer location. Right. So this guy who actually owned a rice farm, a uh, big, big rice farm, walked us to a certain area, and uh, about halfway through, Senator Kerry landed on the ground, and uh, we didn't have much materials when we went to these locations. You know, you, you went in for 30 days. Right. You had to carry everything either in your rucksack or you had a box that we right. would carry in and you'd stay in local hotels and, and whatever. But uh, because of that, I didn't have a computer. I didn't have an iPhone. I didn't have all of that. And so what we did is we drew out, believe it or not, uh, we had toilet seats. We had makeshift toilet seats that we would make. I kept the cardboard box opened it up backwards, and myself and Dr. Finnegan put on there sort of a, uh, a drawing, if you will, an archaeological drawing of what we were looking for and what we were doing. And I tell that story because, and that picture is important, because Kerry flew back uh, with the, uh, the U.S. PACOM chief, which is the Pacific right. commander, the four-star at the time. They flew back. He went to Congress, and uh, <laughs> I didn't see the TV spot. But on TV was actually my cardboard toilet seat drawing. <laughs> he had put it up on, a, uh, on an easel, and he was briefing Congress <laughs> about why this was so important, what they were doing. And so uh, that was unique in the sense, uh, right. again, experiences right. build who you are, right? So right. make the most of what you have right. was kind of a learning lesson there. Now, uh, I don't know, since you grew up more in Island Pond, and I grew up in Newport, so I don't know if you ever knew – Winston Cabby Carboneau, he was Newport City cop, then Orleans County, but he was, re uh, I just, Billy got done, I, over like a 20-year period, he used, well, 15 or so, he used to be the Pied Piper of PTSD, he'd come on, because mm -hmm. I, he, he thanked me so much for help, because he, he had a lot of PTSD before they actually really had a name right. for it, and um, so, um, but, I just really like, got done with our interviews that I recorded over the last few years and did like a 10 or 12 part series mm -hmm. on him and the little details of Vietnam. And he did say, because, you know, he has the Purple Heart uh, and then, uh, mm -hmm. then he has the Bronze Star for Bravery. And, and I entered this verse, it was some of the newspaper articles on him. But he did say some of the people who got hit by really big shells you're not going to find, he says. He said some people took direct hits oh, yeah. to the, where they were vaporized. Yeah. And uh, Yeah, we had those. We had uh, overwater losses were very hard. So right. any of the pilots that had gone down right. into the Gulf of Tonkin, right. uh, any of the river losses, any patrols that were in the river losses, swamps. Believe it or not, up in northern Vietnam, you know, there's huge cliffs. So yeah. any of the things that were on cliffs, you know, we, we – we did what we could. I think at the time, again, uh, testing my memory here, but in 94, 95, there was about 3,200 uh, what we would call reference numbers and people who um, uh, were missing. Right. Okay, we didn't, have, we didn't have data as to you know, where they were or how they were lost completely. Right. And by the time I left in you know, 95, 96, uh, a couple years later, right. we had dwindled that number only by 100 right. because the process, the process is a good process of you bring remains back, you have to go through an identification process. So whatever remains you have, sometimes you have one or two, so, uh, sometimes you may have teeth, sometimes you may have uh, small bones, right. you may not have all of the data they were carrying on them, dog tags would be right. nice, but identifications right. are made biologically, right. and they're made through your maternal, you know, the, your maternal line. Right. So the technology was around where we were able to pull DNA and do analysis to do identifications. Right. 
we had more than 100, but actual identifications and return to family members was in the hundreds. Right. That mission still continues now. Yeah. You know, it's run out of the Pentagon, and it still continues, right. and, and rightly so, because we've had, obviously, uh, Iraq, we've had Afghanistan. You know, there's a number of wars that uh, we've got right. a lot of missing from. Um, uh, you know, uh, another classmate of ours, and you might not even uh, know this story, is um, Eric Brigham. Hmm. Uh, his, well, it would be, it would be his uncle, because I've talked to his mother at quite the length, um, um, as in you know, Eric's mother, her brother was killed in the Korean War, and they, they uh, the last thing I'd known, they still hadn't found, mm. they know how he died, it was a prisoner of war camp, and, yeah, yeah. and she was still, as she told me, she says, when her husband, Eric's father died, there was, she didn't like it, but there was closure. Mm -hmm. But uh, decades later, she yeah. was still waiting yeah. for. I, I tell you, Korea, as we all know, uh, you know, North Korea is really not a very good player in terms of that. In fact, we we did on several occasions have uh, exchanges, if you will, of. Uh, information to the North Koreans, not intel, nothing of that nature, but we would provide them information and they would provide us remains. Uh, the averages were not good, but a lot of times we'd get uh, animal remains, we wouldn't get human bones, we'd get things, we, you can clearly tell the difference between North Korean bone structure and, you know, U.S. bone structure mm -hmm. just because they're living pretty harsh, right. you know, their health is not that... So closure for the Brighams, I, I, my heart goes out to him because Korea has been the one place where we have just not been able to get into to go find them. Right. And, you know, obviously the Korea War, you know, we, we, we pushed back the North Koreans right. to a certain place, but it wasn't all the way to where we were actually fighting. Right. You know, right, that, right. that DMZ was established right. well below where a lot of right. the fighting and a lot of the losses were. So. Yeah, my heart goes out to him. And, yeah. you, know. Uh, you know, back to Vietnam, uh, one thing that my buddy Winston, who's now passed away, one of his big regrets, because he spent so many years angry at the, you know, when I started first hanging out with him, having, you know, talking with him, having him be a guest speaker, he was very angry. He was angry at the, Viet at the Vietnam War. He was angry at his government. He was angry at the Vietnamese people. Mm -hmm. And through, as he said, coming on my shows, through me interviewing him, he realized he came to terms with his Vietnam experience, which included he was uh, he his first was with the first um, air mobile. Mm -hmm. uh, he was one of the first you know yep. early troops in yep. the Vietnam, and yep. then he was with the Americal Division, mm -hmm. and um, but then he came to acceptance that you know no matter how you look at it he said we were in their land mm -hmm. and he says i came to the understanding if canada invaded us he said i would have done the same thing sure. and he said he forgave the vietnamese people who who killed him you know tried to kill him and killed his men and he said he by the time he came to this he didn't think he was healthy enough to go back to vietnam but he said one of his lieutenants went back several times, mm. and he said you would not believe how Americans are treated there. Mm. He said we were returning uh, Vietnam, American Vietnam veterans were treated like returning heroes. Mm -hmm. Did how were you treated? Yeah, so different different time frame, right. uh, but treated very well. The relationships we have with the Vietnamese, the Laotians, uh, and the Cambodians was very good. We had full access into locations that we needed to get to. There were some some military bases that w had been constructed since the uh, early 70s, you know, uh, that we couldn't get into because there were obviously military sites. We wouldn't let Vietnamese onto U.S. military bases if, you know, they're, they're protected. But treated very well. Uh, I, I don't think that we got the, the hero, uh, no. you know, aspect of it, but we were treated very well. Uh, you know, it's it's interesting. Um, Vietnam in and of itself and the uh, veterans from Vietnam, um, 
I look back on that, and, and they had a hell of a ride. Oh, yeah, they did. Everybody, you know, from you, every you, direction. You, you, you came back to a country that was not appreciative. You came back to people that weren't appreciative, that really didn't understand, you know, the whole dynamics of it. And we were talking about the media earlier. I really believe that that was the beginning of the, the, the media, yeah. you know, uh, biases. But right. my but point is, I think after 9-11, Scott – after 9-11, I think the American people uh, had a big shift. You know, it was a cataclysmic event. Right. We were, we were attacked. And uh, it, changed, it changed perceptions of people who were serving, right. why they were serving, uh, and, and it built. That built momentum. And I think after, you know, the 2000s, right. you know, that, that really helped. Uh, the Vietnam veterans, because at that point, th I think there was a a big push to uh, thank right. those who served, and it didn't matter when they served. Greatest generation, obviously, uh, you know, we're losing more and more. more yeah, mostly. Two, yeah. They're mostly gone. Just because yeah, I used to be able, when I, when my wife and I held gatherings, we could fill like the Elks with work. I... I would have to actually sit here and try to stretch my imagination to right. to uh, which um, uh, to how many are left because there's not. Yeah. You know what? With nine eleven, I think uh, that's a that's a good uh, time to uh, end part one of this two part show. Sounds good to me. And thank you for uh, thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. And thank you to the viewers for tuning in to another segment of the Northeast Kingdom Voice.